hi everyone. Okay, so it gives me great pleasure, obviously, as the resident geologist here at the school, to introduce uh, Cass Morrison here from the uh, University College London. Uh, he is going to talk to us about investigating dinosaur ecology and neuroanatomy as an eminent uh, paleontologist from said university. Thank you so much, Cass. Take it away. Uh, good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for the invitation. So here today, I'm going to talk to you about dinosaur ecology um, and your anatomy. So just a brief introduction. Um, as Keen said, I'm a PhD student at UCL uh, and the Natural History Museum. Um, I'm studying uh, theropod dinosaur paleoecology and your anatomy. I've done quite a bit of work in equality, diversity, and inclusion within academia and industry, and I founded the Society of Paleontologists Against Systemic Racism. So I'll go briefly over dinosaurs and the vastness of geological time. So uh, believe it or not, we are closer to Tyrannosaurus rex uh, than Tyrannosaurus rex is to the dinosaur uh, Stegosaurus. So to put that into perspective, arguably the image of Jurassic Park when the T-Rex breaks out is more accurate than this image here when you see a T-Rex uh, versus a Stegosaurus in some sort of fictional battle. Now, here is sort of the geological time scale of the Earth um, summarised in a diagram. So humans are literally modern days here, mammoths would be about here. When you go all the way back 66 million years ago, you had the asteroid impact there. You have T Rex and um, T Rex and Triceratops, sorry. You go back to the Jurassic where you have the marine reptiles, uh, Allosaurus, Diplodocus, you go back to here, to the origin of dinosaurs here and go all the way back to the Cambrian, which is sort of the beginning of a very large um, life, and then all the way down to the beginning of uh, the Earth. And to put that into a 24-hour clock, dinosaurs do not appear till 10.56pm, uh, and humans don't appear till 11.58 uh, and 43 milliseconds. So that's really at the end. So that's really how vast geological time is and uh, the era of dinosaurs have been. So for those who don't know, the age of the dinosaurs, the age of the reptiles is the Mesozoic, meaning middle life. So this is the middle uh, period of time. And there's three main periods, which is the Triassic, which is when dinosaurs first appeared, and they were often quite small. Then we have the Jurassic, which is quite a famous period where you have famous dinosaurs such as Allosaurus, Stegosaurus, Diplodocus, and Brontosaurus. And then you have the final period, which is the Cretaceous, uh, where you have Triassaurus rex, Triceratops, uh, and many other quite famous dinosaurs. And it's called the age of reptiles because you didn't just have the dinosaurs, but you also had the marine reptiles here, and also the flying reptiles as well. Now, uh, dinosaurs are grouped into three main groups, or clades. So you have Well, you have the Ornithischians here, with famous dinosaurs such as Stegosaurus, Triceratops, and Duckbill dinosaurs. You have the Sauropodomorphs, which include all the long-necked, long-tailed ones, such as Brachiosaurus and Apatosaurus. And then you also have the Theropods, which includes dinosaurs such as Tyrannosaurus rex, um, but also birds. So birds are, in fact, dinosaurs. And this is where it comes on to my area of study, which is Theropod dinosaur ecology and brain anatomy. So. In the modern day ecosystem, and I'll take the African savanna as the best example, you usually have one apex predator, such as a lion, um, and then you have a number of other smaller predators present, such as hyenas and cheetahs, um, and they feed on a variety of animals, from giraffes, elephants, zebras and gazelles. Now, um, on the other image, you can see the transverse rex at the top, as a top apex predator, and that feeds again on a variety of different dinosaurs. And such as Triceratops and Ankylosaurus. Now, this comes onto a concept called ecological niche partitioning. Uh, don't worry, I will break this down. And in, it is, in fact, how animals use or organisms use different resources within the environment. So here you can clearly see or appreciate that the uh, giraffe is eating from the tops of the trees. Uh, the animals such as rhinos and eland are eating sort of the middle shrubs and then the various gazelles are eating the grass, and therefore these herbivorous, dinosaurs, um, these herbivorous animals 
can coexist because they're using the vegetation differently. Now, another resource is to stay cool. So for animals, actually overheating can have a lot of negative biological effects. So here, animals use different methods to stay cool. So you have examples like the wildebeest who are using the shades of the trees, zebra and harper beasts are actually um, using uh, their patterning to help them stay cool. And then actually, quite funnily, I find this for the players, the rhinos and the water buffalo are actually wallowing in mud to stay cool. So here, the different animals are using different techniques to help them cool down. Now, this is also true for predators. So here, different uh, predatory animals have different preferences. So um, lions, leopards, hyenas and cheetahs actually use uh, and feed on different preys and therefore they're not all hunting, for example, the zebra. And therefore they are able to coexist because they have slightly different um, uh, preference of their preys. And this is also uh, affects the uh, herbivorous animals because they, again, aren't all hunted by the same thing. So over a vast area space such as Africa, you have different populations and different concentrations of predators and prey and all these animals can coexist. Now this is quite an interesting study. So prior to the 1990s uh, there were no wolves in Yellowstone National Park in North America and the Yellowstone National Park were dominated by elk. So there were many elk um, and there weren't many other animals present. Now they reintroduced wolves into Yellowstone in the 1990s and believe it or not animals such as bears, beavers, frogs, different types of birds and even new plants started to appear such as willows. Now the reason for this is because the deer were eating up all the plants uh, and many of the sort of slower growing ones especially the willow. Now by allowing the wolves to return they hunted the deer so the deer population was reduced Willow started to grow, so beavers could return to make dams. Um, bears were then able to return because there was more like swollen um, rivers, and even stuff like frogs and ravens returned because there were new uh, ecological niches uh, appearing, as well as even other other herbivorous animals such as pronghorns. Now, what this shows is that there's often balance in the ecosystems, and this image represents it quite well. So most of these uh, dinosaurs here are herbivorous excluding sort of the small carnivore ones at, at the bottom and there's one right there, one large herbivorous carnivorous dinosaur. So the majority of the animals within the ecosystem are often uh, herbivorous with uh, fewer carnivores. Now when two animals have identically the same niche, um, and this is that they're having the same food, the same resource, the same ways of cooling, one will outcompete the other and this will lead to the ex well, this will lead to the extinction of one of them. Um, so two animals with identical niches can't coexist. Now you can appreciate amongst with these herbivorous dinosaurs, you can see the taller ones eating the tops of the trees and the smaller ones eating the ground. Now this is also true for the large, uh, uh, the large theropods. The, a number of them did coexist. Now we're not talking about like this in Jurassic Park 3, uh, T-Rex versus Spinosaurus nor in the more recent iteration of this. However, what we are talking about is a situation here where you have four large uh, carnivorous dinosaurs coexisting um, in a single ecosystem. Now, this is actually quite rare in terms of the ecosystems that have already been studied within the Mesozoic. Um, and the best uh, ecosystem studied within the Mesozoic comes from North America, and these are often dominated by a single um, apex predator and as you can see here this is the modern African savannah so you have the lions here and then you have a smaller and smaller predators but there's a gradual size change um, on the top image from the modern African savannah however uh, within late Cretaceous North America you have usually one as always in nature there's always an exception or two you have one large apex predator and then there's a massive gap and then you have a number of smaller um, uh, carnivorous and uh, predatory dinosaurs. Now, this is one of the exceptions, Gorgosaurus and the Spetosaurus did coexist for a couple of million years um, in the late Cretaceous and again um, in uh, Mongolia, the Tarbosaurus, the larger one, uh, coexisted with Aliaramus. However, um, in these ecosystems in North America, as you can see, 
we have one large uh, plenty dinosaur and the rest of them, excluding the small ones, are herbivorous. And again, with Tyrannosaurus, we have Tyrannosaurus rex here, and the rest of them are either dinosaurs or they are uh, uh, aquatic or marine, such as the crocodiles or the marine reptiles. So there, there's very few uh, coexisting large predatory dinosaurs. However, the situation of Gondwana, so these are the southern continents, uh, such as South America, Africa, India, and Madagascar, uh, was very different. So this is actually a relatively typical um, ecosystem within Gondwana, where you have on that image about six uh, predatory dinosaurs coexisting with a number of longer and larger uh, long-necked sauropods. Um, but this is actually quite common throughout the Mesozoic, so here's an example of different ecosystems within the Jurassic, and many of them have three to five large to medium predatory dinosaurs. So this raises the question of what is going on and how could all these large dinosaurs coexist? And this is a term I've coined, which is the, the Rosetta clade, so the Rosetta Stone is a famous um, sort of stone found in Egypt which had four languages on and that allowed uh, archaeologists at the time to, for the first time, decipher ancient Egyptian because prior to this, its discovery people weren't able to understand what the ancient Egyptian uh, text means. And this is a clay called Megosauroidae uh, and it includes famous dinosaurs such as uh, Spinosaurus and Baryonyx and actually the first dinosaur ever discovered Megalosaurus. And here is just the Fairport family tree. So at the very bottom here we have birds as living dinosaurs. And then we have Tyrannosaurus rex, which is uh, less derived. And then here, so they're not too distant from T-Rex, we have the Megatoroidae, and we have Spinosaurus and, and Megatosaurus. Um, and now onto everyone's favourite dinosaur. So this is quite controversial, is it T-Rex or Spinosaurus? You know, just don't debate them online and you'll be fine. Um, and what has occurred, or what was occurring alongside Spinosaurus, is that Spinosaurus lived through this very uh, large uh, other predatory dinosaurs called Carcodontosaurus, and often they've been depicted fighting one another, uh, often for dominance, because people ask the question, how could these two large, very different predatory dinosaurs coexist? And actually, it comes down to the fact that Spinosaur, Spinosaurus, or Spinosauridae, uh, the family group, were the first dinosaurs to be widely accepted as per perceivorous, i.e. that they ate fish. Um, and I'll go over some of the evidence for this. So first of all, we had stomach contents. So in the 90s, or just prior to the 90s, uh, a dinosaur in the UK actually, from Sussex, so that's actually not too far from here, was discovered with a baby dinosaur in his stomach, but also with uh, fish scales. And these fish scales had actually been corroded, so we were able to look. Our, um, scientists were able to look under the mic uh, microscope and see that these fish scales were corroded, and they were actually corroded with stomach acid. So clearly, this dinosaur ate fish. Um, as well as more recent studies, which show that the spinosaurs have a heavier bone density compared to other dinosaurs, which suggests that I mean, this was a really ad advantage for uh, semi-aquatic or aquatic animals. Um, as well as post cranial morphology. So here, Spinosaurus has a very uh, tadpole like tail, and this has been hypothesized to help it move within water, um, as well as isotopes, which we will cover here. So, this is an isotopic di diagram. Um, chemistry can be used in dinosaurs. So, um, tooth enamel is a very well preserved uh, biological um, substance, and it's very difficult to destroy and the chemical signatures of tooth enamel can last millions and millions of years. Um, therefore, what you need, the only thing you need to take away from here is that we've analysed, or scientists have analysed, crocodiles, turtles, fish, spinosaurs, and other uh, terrestrial theropods, and found that spinosaurs plot uh, close to uh, crocodiles and turtles, and the reason for this is that water has a heavier... Um, um, water will have has a heavier signature uh, for the heavier uh, oxygen isotopes uh, compared to animals that live in a terrestrial environment and therefore spinosaurs were deemed to spend most of their time in water compared to other theropod dinosaurs um, as well as evidence of finding bone beds so when you have um, sediments you have an accumulation of bones um, of fish scales and spinosaurus teeth to the exclusion of other 
dinosaur in teeth. Therefore, um, then that, the, the, uh, the conclusion is that um, spinosaurus were feeding on these fish and other dinosaurs weren't. Now, um, that occurred during the Cretaceous, which was the last period of dinosaurs, and it was often assumed these were the first um, and only fish-eating dinosaurs. However, um, there is evidence, and part of my research causes this, of there being evidence for fish-eating in the Jurassic. So, some of the common evidence um, is there's a dinosaur called Plopiporon. It was discovered in the 1800s. Um, unfortunately, its remains were dis uh, destroyed in uh, World War II because they were based in France. Um, however, that did have fish in its stomach. Uh, more recently, in 2002, there's a dinosaur called uh, Dupedosaurus, which has been found with fish stomachs in its, in its remains, uh, as well as another dinosaur called Eusteptus wanderlus. And based on the shape of its teeth and the snout, it has been suggested to be a fish eater. Um, there's also uh, trace fossil evidence. So not all fossils come in the form of bones or hard body parts. Some of them come as trace fossils. So, for example, if an animal was my, or animals were migrating and say this is a body of water, they would migrate perpendicular to the body of, body of water. If animals start moving towards the body of water, um, it suggests that they're using the water for something. Um, often probably for drinking. Now, these footprints were found next to a saltwater lagoon. So this was a salt water, so the animals clearly weren't um, drinking the salt water, but the footprints were organised in such a way that they were very methodical and therefore the animals had purpose for going towards this uh, saltwater lagoon and it has been suggested for feeding uh, or scavenging. Um, but there's another interesting fact a lot of these Jurassic megasaurs have been found in habitats which are one very low energy. So what this means is there's not enough energy within the water to transport large dinosaur uh, carcasses. So we are talking about animals five, six, seven meters long. So there's very low energy. And therefore the, the bodies will not be um, washed away and therefore they're being preserved where they, they lived and they died. Um, as well as a lack of herbivorous um, dinosaurs or fauna coexisting with these uh, therapod dinosaurs. Now, based on the African savannah, some estimates say for every one lion, you need to have uh, 400 zebra or equivalent uh, prey animals. Um, and therefore, because we are continuously finding these um, carnivorous dinosaurs and not finding any evidence for herbivorous taxa, it does raise the question, what, they are, what are they eating? Um, and there's, they also have split um, where they're living within the environment. So, for example, the megalosaurs, um, the ones who have been sus suspected to be fish eaters, prefer living around the coast, uh, whereas other dinosaurs which are known to eat meat, such as the Allosaurus, have been found in more inland habitats, such as uh, floodplains, which would be the equivalent of, say, the African savanna. Um, and it has also been theorised that some of these megalosaurs preferred hunting and, uh, and living in and around waterways uh, to avoid direct competition again with the allosaurs. Um, and there is also an interesting partitioning between the spinosaurs here, which preferred and have only really been found in freshwater environments, compared to the megalosaurs, which have been found uh, more in the marine water environments. And then we come back to this. So the full uh, coexisting large dinosaurian uh, species uh, have been known as a phenomenon known as Stromer's Riddle because at the time in the, 19, uh, the early 1920s you found four large predatory dinosaurs and only one relatively small herbivorous taxa. And it was only actually quite recently that this was in part, part solved. So in the early 2000s this massive very large dinosaur was discovered called Parallel Titan and this showed that in that environment there were very large uh, herbivorous taxa that could support a variety of um, herb um, carnivores. However, what was more telling was the type of environment. So to, to, in, today's, uh, in, today, in, in modern ecosystems, the tropical rainforest is the most productive ecosystem in the world. That's where you have the greatest biodiversity and most biological production of plants. Um, and that they are able to support a very wide variety of plants and animals. During the Mesozoic, there weren't the equivalent of the um, modern uh, tropical rainforest, however there were mangroves and mangrove swamps. 
So the second most productive uh, environment today are the forest or Everglades and these type of mangrove environments. So what we are able to deduce is that this environment that supported these very four large predatory dinosaurs were actually the most productive in the world at the time. Um, so they would have had a great biomass, but also that there would have been a number of uh, a number of herbivorous taxa present, such as the large parallel titan, as well as smaller um, dinosaurs and smaller animals. And um, within the fossil record, smaller animals are very uh, much more less likely to be preserved, and therefore there'll be less evidence of them. But we do know that this is a highly productive environment, and therefore the opportunity to um, to have a a uh, very diverse and productive ecosystem uh, was deduced. Now, this comes on to Megalosauridae. So, it's been suspected that they may be fish eaters, but there hasn't been uh, a wide enough evidence for it to become widely accepted. Um, so, this is sort of part of my PhD. So, here we have uh, the diets of different uh, fragile dinosaurs. So, those in green are those which have evolved herbivory which is quite unusual for animals to go from carnivory to herbivory because plants are very uh, are less nutritious and harder to digest. Uh, we have the spinosaurs, which are known fish eaters. We have the megalosaurs, which I'm investigating. And then we have some of these earlier dinosaurs, which have again been suspected to be uh, fish eating, and I'm also testing some of those. So these are small dinosaurs called dinosaurs. Um, they were in prehistoric planet, if anyone's seen those. Um, they were really done really dirty in there. Um, but their diet seems to be far more diverse than previously thought. Uh, a couple of years ago, one was shown to be herbivorous. It had a very herbivore-like beak, which was the first time that that was discovered in within that group of dinosaurs. And the Cetosaurus here has been suspected to either eat fish or uh, eat invertebrates. And then, uh, again, there are a couple of... Um, uh, carnivorous ones which would act as somewhat like uh, raptors. Now, there's uh, an important thing to discuss in terms of stomach contents. Now, stomach contents are the animal's last meal, and there is a concept in biology of fallback food. So, everyone has their favourite food, say pizza, chips, avocado, whatever it is. And then, if someone's really hungry, they might eat something that they don't really like, but you know they do it because they're that hungry. Animals have a similar sort of um, uh, similar sort of process in which they have their preferred foods where they're able to get most of their nutrition and are able to sustain, to sustain themselves. But they also have food that during hardship that they will eat. Now not to be cynical, these animals have eaten their last meal and died and therefore stomach contents could be fallback food rather than preferred meals. However, there is such thing called microware on tea. So we have already covered enamel, and enamel is a very strong substance. So enamel can actually be used under the microscope to look at its structure. And actually different diets, at least within uh, dinosaurs and its closely related um, cousins, it's been shown that the microware on the tea can represent different diets. And what's important here is, where is it? Passivory um, has the smoothest texture. So if we are able to look at the microwave of the teeth, we were able to deduce the different diets of the different dinosaurs. And therefore, if we could find smooth textures, this would be evidence for passivory. So this is a carnivorous dinosaur called Neoveneta. And as you can see, it has quite a good number of scratches um, with a variety of lengths and a variety of thicknesses. Here we have a Spinosaurus, so we know this is a known fish eater. And as you can see, um, this is just uh, ignoring the larger cracks, which are uh, just due to preservation or uh, biological pres uh, geological preservation. You can see it has a couple of, uh, of marks, um, but not many. Now, here is a Megalosaurus. So this is one of the Megalosaurus, which is the ones we're testing at the moment. And as you can see, it doesn't have as much as many scratches near Venta, the carnival, but it has more than um, the spinosaur. So, if you put them up next to one another, the megalosaur sits somewhat in between near Venta, the carnival, and the fish-eating spinosaur. 
Now, there's another thing we can say, which is dinosaur neuroanatomy. So, unfortunately, dinosaur soft brains aren't preserved. That would be amazing, but they're not preserved. However, um, as birds are dinosaurs, and we know that in birds, the skull, uh, the brain bones, the brain case bones, wrap around uh, the, the brain. So, if you were to take a bird brain, a um, bird skull, and um, micro CT, or use a medical scanner to CT the skull. You can then reconstruct the brain from that um, endocranial or that brain cavity. Now, as uh, birds are dinosaurs, and we also, um, in many of these theropod dinosaurs, find brain impressions, so you can see the brain matter has been pushing against the brain bones, and that's also preserved. It's a fair assumption to say if we can recreate uh, the brain cavity, we're able to recreate the structure of the brain, such as here. This is the brain of Tyrannosaurus rex. And we're also able to reconstruct in some dinosaurs the inner ear. So here we have the brain of Tyrannosaurus rex, and what that, that can tell us it has, you know, the optic, the, the olfactory bulbs are quite large, so it had a good sense of smell. It also had good optic lobes here, quite large optic lobes, so it also had a really good sense of um, sight as well. And therefore, we are able to, you know, because we are able to reconstruct the shape of the brain. We can understand such as things such as smell, sight, hearing, and even intelligence. So this becomes slightly more complicated because estimating the mass of an extinct animal is difficult because you have to estimate not just its size but also sort of bone mass, muscle mass, fat mass. But it gives a good relative comparison with other dinosaurs if you are using the same metrics as controls. Um, and there's even, what we'll touch on in the next slide, there's a sense of touch that we can also observe to some degree. And this is, called, this is done by the neurovascular canal. So here's the head of Tyrannosaurus. Here, that's what the eye is. Um, and this is the snout or the rostrum. So this is the front of the animal. And the takeaway from here is all those different colors, the red, the green, and the blue, these are neurovascular canals, and they, this just sends sensory information from the snout uh, back to the animal's head. So the complexity of these neurovascular canals can tell us something about the complexity of its sense of uh, touch uh, or ability for it to sense uh, its interactions with um, whatever the snout is coming in contact with, and often that would be prey animals. Um, but again, we also have the resting head position. So the inner ear has been able to provide us some, some really interesting information. So the resting position of the inner ear, was, we were able to tell this dinosaur here, called Nisosaurus niger in Africa, unlike many sauropods, which had its head more like either like horizontal or vertically, it actually had its head down like a lawnmower. It had about 500 teeth and literally would lawnmower up sort of the vegetation which would have been ferns and actually very rarely lifted its head um, and that was quite an unusual evolutionary trait for this group of dinosaurs. Um, here we have one of the spinosaurs called the Irritator um, and it actually had its head about uh, 45 degrees so the snout would have been at about 45 degrees um, from the horizontal and in this position so even though it has a very long snout here in this position the field of view, the snout is outside the field of view, to tell from the shape of the brain that it had a very good reflexes, so it was able to move its head very quickly. Now, that is really useful for a, uh, a predatory animal that was catching something smaller than it. So a large animal like this would have ca caught a fish which was significantly smaller than it, but being able to move its head quickly, and when its head, is, head held its head in this 45 degree angle, not having the snout um, interfere with, with the field of view all suggested that it ate fish. Um, and then we have some of the other predatory dinosaurs, such as Carnotaurus here, um, that was in Jurassic World. Um, it had, uh, they had a good sense of smell. Their eyesight weren't, wasn't great, but again, these animals would have been hunting the large sauropods, which were relatively slow especially compared to themselves, and therefore having a good sense of smell was far better than its eyesight. Um, however, some of them had different um, compositions of smell, but because we haven't made enough comparisons or we haven't had enough preserved skulls, we can't actually deduce exactly what that difference is. 
but hopefully I will be making enough comparisons to be maybe understand why it smells so unique. Um, we also have this really interesting group of dinosaurs. Now, there's one group of dinosaurs where we don't know really where they top in the family tree is this group called Megaraptora. Um, they do look somewhat like large raptors and actually superficially resemble the ones in the original Jurassic Park without scales. Um, but their placement could be anywhere from being very closely related to T-Rex to being more closely related to Allosaurus or somewhere in between. Um, they may also have impacted the rise of the large Tyrannosaurus such as Tyrannosaurus Rex. Um, but these were actually the apex rulers just before the uh, asteroid impact uh, 66 million years ago in uh, eastern Gondwana, such as Australia, southern South America, and Antarctica. And the interesting thing about their brains is that they have a, a weaker sense of smell than the Tyrannosaurs, but neither is their eyesight great. So it really does raise the question of what were they doing. Um, and here's some of the data, some of my data. So we have our pescivores, baryonyx, um, and the spinosaur. We have our known carnivores, the jungosaurus and the Aventa, And we have the dinosaur we're testing, megalosaurus. So here we've actually medically, uh, we've seen, we've used uh, medical scanners or more advanced ones, such as micro CT scanners, and scanned the dinosaur bones. And we are actually able to segment out and reconstruct the neurovascular canals. Um, and here is the premaxillary, or the very front of the snout, of Bionix, which is a fish eater here. And you can see quite a large number of neurovascular canals and quite a complexity present there. And then you have the Jungosaurus, which is a known carnivore, actually ate its own kind, but many animals actually do that, um, which have, has a less complexity um, in the neurovascular canals there. Uh, this is the lower jaw of Bionix, and you can see it's quite uh, sinuous and there's quite a few, uh, quite a lot of branching there. Um, and compared to the Jungosaurus and Neoveneta, which has a significantly less amount of branching. Now we have Megalosaurus. Megalosaurus has somewhat more branching than Neoveneta um, and the Jungosaurus, but less so than Baryonyx there. So in summary, my primary uh, research, or my PhD, suggests that uh, megalosaurs and spinosaurs have neurovascular systems more similar to each other than to other carnivorous theropods. And this suggests that megalosaurs, uh, or the, state, uh, the ancestral state of megalosaurs, was silvery and not carnivory. So, uh, in summary, there seems to be a greater diversity in ecological niches in many large-bodied uh, predatory dinosaurs that coexisted. And many, uh, and many di and more diverse diets than previously thought. But we can use cutting edge science uh, and technologies to look into fossils in a new way. So uh, thank you for listening and happy to take any questions. So the different dinosaurs have different reactions to other dinosaurs? Yes, so um, for example, herbivorous dinosaurs would have wanted to avoid carnival, uh, carnivals, but also interactions between different carnivals would also have varied, because some would have wanted to scare others off for, for off kills or carcasses, and also for prime hunting grounds. That's a good question. So, um, at the time, in the 90s, the Jurassic Park dinosaurs are relatively accurate for the time. Um, there are some artistic licenses, uh, naturally, um, but the size of the Velociraptors, uh, they were actually based off uh, a recent discovery in North America where the paleontologists at the time actually thought they were Velociraptor. It later turned out to be a separate species, either Dinonychus or Utahraptor. So there were raptor-sized dinosaurs that large. Um, what I would say is the Jurassic World movies, so the more recent ones, do not have that same 
accuracy for the time of the movies they are using what was in the 90s and haven't really updated the science. Yeah, really, yeah. Um, so, Um, that's a good question. So, complete skeletons are very rare. We do have, we have a large enough sample across all dinosaurs to know what the rough uh, body parts are. What's very common is having bits of bone. So we, get, we have lots of bits of bone or lots of very fragmentary skeletons. So, if you have, for example, enough skulls, you can compare all the skulls. If you have enough like limb bones, you can compare all the limb bones. What's very rare is having very complete skeletons, so it's very hard to complete, compare like complete skeletons, but you sort of, if you understand where they are within the family tree, you can then understand um, you know, what they should look like.